All right, now, of course, we just read Leviticus chapter 20. It's a very significant chapter in the book of Leviticus as far as the law is concerned because it covers many instances in which the death penalty was to be instituted. And that's exactly what I'm preaching on this morning is the death penalty. There's a lot of Christians today that don't understand, for one, they don't understand the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they think that all the law should be just, is just gone, like it's just disappeared, and that, I don't know, like we could probably just throw away over half of our Bibles because that's just all Old Testament. But that's not the way it works. And um, if you just read the Bible in context, you, could, you, can, you can get that and you can understand that. Yes, there have been a few things that have changed in the law, but they've been spelled out. They've been laid out for us. And I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Not too much in detail. What I really want to cover this morning, we're going to look at all of the instances in which the Bible, which God ordained a death penalty. And people today, it, it, one, of, one of the things that prompted this sermon is about a week or two ago, Pastor Anderson preached a sermon called, um, you know, AIDS, the Judgment of God or something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was called. Basically, it's, it's God's judgment on the homos. And, and it's a, it was a very accurate sermon. Very, you know, I would say I would agree with, with everything or just about everything that he said. I couldn't think of anything that he said in that sermon that I did not agree with. And... All of this outrage stems from what the Bible actually says in Leviticus 20.13. We just read the entire chapter of Leviticus, and we're going to go into all of these different things. But what people get so infuriated about these days in the wicked society that we live in today is, oh, the precious sodomites, the precious homos out there that we just need to protect them, and we need to lift them up and exalt them and let them just flaunt their, their pride and their wickedness through the streets of our cities and just accept it because Satan is running this country. And that's, that's the way that it is in this society today. And people have just been brainwashed because they can't get their stinking eyes away from the TV for two minutes to pick up their Bible and read it and see what God actually has to say about it. They get brainwashed by watching the homosexuality on TV, watching the, you know, the, they've, been, they've been shocked enough to where they're desensitized to where now they've come to the point to accept the fact that two men or two women can be intimate with each other and that that's okay and that that's normal when that's not what the Bible preaches at all. But I'm not going to get all into the homos, but that's by looking at a lot of the reactions and the responses to the sermon that was preached, I mean, for one, people just have a, a massive ignorance as to God's word and to what it actually says. But people also don't understand, you know, the Bible is a book that explains a lot of things to us, how we're supposed to live our lives. It also talks about instituting human government. Okay, God did not leave us clueless as far as how to do things in our life in general. It's a, it, it has everything that we need to know in order to live, thrive, and survive. And, and everything that we need to know about God, everything that we need to know for our own personal lives, how should we live and what should we be doing, and even just in general, it talks about setting up a government. Now, in the Old Testament, there was a point where God was the ruler of the nation. And that was with the nation of Israel. And basically, you know, the, the other nations that would surround Israel, they had kings. They had a man in charge of their country. And, and typically that was the form of government that was around then. There would be one person and he was the ruler. He was in charge. He made up the laws. He made up the rules. And he kind of dictated the way things were going to be within the country. Now, does that sound like a perfect form of government? Because I don't think so. When you have a sinner, when you have a man, just like any one of us, we're not perfect. Even if you had a righteous man as the king, it's not going to be the perfect government because they're still human beings. They're still going to fall. And especially when they're in that position of king, the Bible warns all about that. I'm not going to get into that either this morning. But, um, you know, man has made that law. And any time man is in charge of just making all the rules and making all the laws, it's going to be flawed. It's not going to be perfect. But we know that God is perfect and that God is a judge and God is the lawmaker. And um, he gave us his laws. I mean, think about the laws we have today in Arizona and in the United States for that matter. 
somebody wrote those laws. Right? Somebody came up with, some man wrote down these laws and said, these are the laws of the land. Or some men did that, right? Not just one, but, it, but some men did that. And, and other men just decided and said, okay, well, these gonna, are going to be our laws. And um, they're not perfect. Now, a lot of the laws we have today might line up with biblical laws. Those laws, I would say, are good. But many of them don't. Many of them are just in excess, and, and there's just tons and tons of laws on the books as it is. But those are man-made laws. And there was a time when the nation of Israel had God as their king. Everyone else had a human king. God was the king of the nation of Israel. And he established his laws as their laws. He said, well, these, this is the law of the Lord. And this is the law that they were supposed to follow. And the Bible says that the law of the Lord is perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. And people today seem to have a problem with God's laws. And they say that they think that they know better. They know way better than God knows. They think that... Um, you know, oh, God's idea of justice is flawed, but I know better. You know, they'll say, oh, the, you know, there's some people out there say, well, the death penalty, that's inhumane. We can't do that. That was for the barbaric time. Oh, yeah, back thousands of years ago. Now we're so much more civilized. Now, we, you know, we have evolved. We are so much better now than we ever were. We don't, we don't need that anymore. And you know what that, that, that arrogant, proud, haughty attitude is saying is that, this God, what, what was he thinking? We don't, we don't need these types of laws. Those laws are inferior to what I've come up with in my own mind. And people today that, that are disgusted at the fact that the Bible condemns homosexuality and that there are actually people who still are alive today that believe that, you know what? We would be way better off if we would just follow God's laws as opposed to man's laws. Now, the Bible is very clear as well that God didn't ordain to have a bunch of people running around and taking the law into their own hands and just executing judgment because something's wrong. He instituted a government in a way of dealing with things and having judges and having, you know, and, and having witnesses and, and having this whole series of events happen to where there's diligent inquiry made and, and you know, the facts are discovered before anyone would be put to death or even you know, convicted of any type of a crime. It's a, there's a justice system that God has laid out in the Bible. And that's what we ought to follow today. That's why we don't just go and say, oh, well, homosexuality should be you know, punished by death, so we're going to go out and just start killing all the homos. No, we don't do that because that's not what God has ordained. He's, he has ordained the, the, the form of government should be taking care of that. And if we had a righteous government, it would be doing that. And we should be pushing for that to happen within our government, but we don't take the law into our own hands. Now... The question, the, the question that Christians need to ask themselves today is, do you really believe that the Bible is God's word? And do you think his ways are better than your ways? And that should be a simple question to answer. Do you think that God's thoughts are better than your thoughts? Do you think God's ways are better than your ways? And do you really believe that this book is the word of God? If you don't believe this book is the word of God, I can understand why you might be outraged. Because you don't have an authority. You don't have, you know... You have your own thoughts, and that's it. And why are your thoughts better than my thoughts then? What's, what's to make any one, any one person's individual, whatever they come up with, why is any one better than another if there is no God? If God doesn't exist, if we don't have God's word, if there's no authority from God, then, then who are you to say what I can and can't do? Who are you to impose your morality on me if it's just one man versus another? But if it's coming from God... Well, he trumps my opinion and your opinion. This is God's laws. And we need to go back to his laws because he knows what's right. And he, he has instituted these laws for a reason. And if you think things are different today than they were back then, well, is that because God has changed all of a sudden? And that's what people think, that like, oh, well, God in the Old Testament, yeah, he was real mean and angry, but now he's not. God doesn't change. God is who he is. God is holy. God is perfect. And we're going to see some of the reasons why God is instituted. And actually, we, you know, in this chapter we read in Leviticus 20, he explains, he says, look, 
that the land spew you not out. That's why he wants you to obey these laws. And that is in one of the first few verses. We'll get to that in a little bit. I have it in my notes. But basically the whole point that, um, that God has given us these laws, and he explains, he says, you know, the people before you did all of these things. The people have, have done all of, the, all, of these, all of these laws that we see where he institutes death penalty and just other laws where it's not necessarily the death penalty. He says that every, the, the people who lived there before, they committed all of these abominations. They had done all these things. And that's why he brought the judgment that he brought against them. And people, the, the atheists like to point to that, to that judgment. They'll say, see, God's a, a child murderer and all this other stuff. And you have this immoral God because of the events that happened when the children of Israel came and destroyed completely the nations that were, that were in the promised land prior to them. And what they'll say is that, you know, how could you possibly worship? And they'll mock God and ridicule God, saying that, that, oh, you are a horrible person because you believe in a God that would do these things, that would commit these crimes against innocent people. But that's because they're ignorant of God's word, whether willingly or not, and of what was actually happening. So when he gives these laws in Leviticus 20, and some of them are horrible things like bestiality, lying down with an animal, homosexuality, all this wicked, perverted stuff. You know, a man lying with his father's wife. I mean, this, this is like, you, you, what else are you going to do? What, what else is there to do? What else is left in perversion than all the things that are mentioned here in Leviticus 20? There's like, there's nothing else to do. This is how far they had come. So God brought his judgment on the nation as a whole and wiped them out. And this is what America needs to understand today is that God hasn't changed. God has the same moral values for us today as he did back then. He's not just permissive and just saying, okay, promiscuity is just fine. Hey, now it's fine, you man, to lie with your father's wife. Hey, now it's okay. Now it's okay to kill babies. Look at what they did in, in, in verse number one, or verse number two. Verse number, no, 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 no. Verse number three. And I will set my face against that man, will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my, my holy name. It was in verse number two. Again, thou shalt say un, um, to the children of Israel, whosoever he be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. So you're going to tell me, oh, person who wants to get rid of this Old Testament, this Old Testament law, that if someone were to burn their baby unto a devil, unto a false god called Molech, that they shouldn't be put to death? Oh, well, that's Old Testament. That's Leviticus chapter 20. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to have anything to do with Leviticus chapter 20. Oh, oh yeah, because these laws don't matter. They don't apply anymore, right? So now it should just be okay if you have an infant that you can just burn them in the fire to, another, to a false god. That should be fine. There should be no laws. Hey, Jesus came and destroyed the law. So I guess that's okay then, right? This is the idiocy, the stupidity, because there's a certain sin that they love and they want to cling to, and for whatever reason they think it's okay, that they just want to throw out the whole law or they just want to pick and choose and say, you know what? No, we just don't want to follow this law because this law, I don't like what that says because that's not popular today. You're insane if you think that murderers and baby murderers shouldn't be put to death. You're insane. There is something wrong with your head. These are basic. This should be basic truth. This is common sense stuff. Unfortunately, we live in such a wicked society that it's not common sense anymore. We need to get back to God's word and God's version of morality. Let's go through some of these. Let's go through some of these crimes punishable by death. So we saw the murdering of babies here. The next one is actually, and, and again, this is something that atheists love to point out and mock and ridicule the Bible and that 
they'll get Christians to back down on because they don't know the Word of God. And their only response is, oh, well, that's the Old Testament. Oh, well, that's the Old Testament. And that's what your, your average ignorant Christian's response today will be, oh, that's the Old Testament. Oh, I, we don't really follow the Old Testament anymore today. And just because a few things have changed, and again, I'll get into that with the, the animal sacrifices and the Levitical priesthood laws. Okay, yeah, those things have been, have been accomplished and the priesthood has changed, but that has nothing to do with murder. That has nothing to do with theft. That has nothing to do with these other laws that, that still stand today and that have not been altered at all in the New Testament. But look at verse number 9. The Bible says, For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. I believe that 100%. Amen. That should be the law. Now, what people think like, just because, again, today you have, people have a lot of unruly children. And see, there's also a misconception about what this verse is even talking about. And you could probably preach at least half a sermon dedicated to what this is talking about. But it's really not that difficult. Cursing, it's not just like swearing. Okay, it's not just, if someone, if a child just uses like a curse word and, you know, like, like um, you know, an S word or F word or something like that, that's not what this is talking about. When you lay a curse upon your own father or your own mother, that is wickedness. And a curse would be like, I wish you would die and rot in hell forever. That would be a curse. That is wishing some you know, horrible evil on somebody. And for a child to say that to their parents, that is extreme wickedness. See, God has ordained an authority structure in our lives for our own good and for our own benefit. That's why he put the man as the head of the household and the man and the wife over the children. They dictate, they give the rules, and that they need to be revered and, ex and respected by the children and obeyed. Because all of that also is an image of our relationship with God. God is to be revered. God is to be respected. God is to be obeyed. We need to have the same type of an attitude towards Him. And, and God is very serious about keeping this structure in place and keeping that respect because in place. And we're going to see a similar law that applies to God as well. It's not just for, for us as humans with our children. Okay? This is serious. God, God wants, us, wants that family to be a strong unit. And he says, look, if, if you have a child, they're basically going to be like a child of the devil. They're just going to curse. And it, this isn't just being like your, right, your average disobedient child that does something that against what their parent says. That's not what this is talking about. Okay, there's a difference. But a lot of Christians, they'll back off on this. So, oh, that was Old Testament. No, don't back off on God's word. If it's, if it's his word, then he meant what he said. This isn't something you have to make an excuse for. This is God's word, and God knows better than you. Okay, and, and we're not going to make an excuse for what's written in here. It's the word of the Lord, and it's, and it's pure words. And this is, this is right. So uh, verse number 10 talks about adultery. It says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. Again, Something that would be think is just lunacy in today's society because everybody's going out and committing adultery. And they're thinking, oh, well, I shouldn't be put to death for that. Well, yes, you should, according to God. That should be the law of the land today. Is if, a, if a man or a woman goes out and commits adultery, the adulterer and the adulteress shall both be put to death. That would be, you know what, we'd see a lot less divorce. We'd see a lot less of, of adultery going on, that's for sure. People would be thinking two and three and ten times before they would ever act impulsively on some fleshly lust like an animal and control themselves as, as a civilized human being to be able to say, well, wait a minute, no, I'm married. I am not going to hurt my wife or my children this way with this act. I'm going to hold off myself, especially because there's also this, this, this other punishment that's going to be associated with that where I could lose my life and it's not worth my life. And God is, is, is signifying how important all of these, anything that has a death penalty on it, these are serious sins. These are not just minor sins, if you will. These are serious. It's, it's, it's enough for you to lose your life. Let's look at this, the continue, verse 11. 
It says, And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon him. Again, talking about lying with your father's wife. Now, I don't think this is necessarily referring to your, to your own mother. I mean, that could be the case, but that would be really weird and really bizarre. Um, I believe this is talking about your father having a wife, you know, either from being divorced or being widowed or whatever the case may be. But either way, I think it would all apply that the, the death penalty would still, especially if it was something like his own mother. But I also want to point this out too, because this is a very important point, and I mentioned it earlier, that it's not our jobs to carry out the sentence of God's law, especially if it's not instituted in our human government. This actual event, keep your finger on Leviticus 20, we're going to come back to this, and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This actual sin was committed in the New Testament, and we have a record of it. And we have a record of how they handled it. Because at that time in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 5, the laws were not that this man should be put to death. Okay? So we can see how to deal with these things that, you know, they're... If there is a law, and you could say, well, adultery, it's not the death penalty today. So should we just go out and start, and start holding trials and convicting and killing people of adultery because that's what God's law should be? No, not if it's not part of our human government. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. The exact law we just saw in Leviticus 20. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So again, there a lot, the, their, their reaction is that they're puffed up. And this is what a lot of people do today when confronted with a, an egregious sin that's worthy of the death penalty, a lot of people's reaction is to just be rebellious and to puff themselves up and to say, oh, it's not that bad. Oh, we didn't do anything that wrong. Oh, it's okay. And just puff themselves up at it. And he says, you should, you should be mourning about it. That's, that's wickedness and that's sad. You need to be mourning about that this thing even happened. That these are the Gentiles don't even do this stuff. The heathen, the, the unsaved heathen don't even do the things that is guilty of going on within your church. And he says in verse 3, For I verily as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. I love this verse because Paul's saying, look, I have judged. And what will people tell you today? Oh, you shouldn't be judging. Oh, you think the homo should be put that way? Don't judge. Don't judge their sin because you're a sinner too. You can't judge. The apostle Paul just judged right here. He says, I've judged already. I don't even have to be there. I heard what happened, and I've already made a judgment in my mind what needs to be done to this person. So don't tell me I can't judge. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches about not being a hypocrite in your judgment. It doesn't say you could never judge anything, anytime, anywhere. That's ridiculous. Paul's already judged. As though I were present concerning him that hath done hath so done this deed. Verse number four, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So he's saying, look, you have to give that guy over to Satan. He needs to be kicked out of the church and just give him up unto Satan and let Satan have his way with him. Okay, we can't put him to death as the Mosaic Law says that we should, because that's not our human government today. They need to be just given up over unto Satan. And, and that's how you deal with it. Because he's not saying take the law in your own hands. And that's not what we should be doing. That's not what we advocate anyone who's listening to, to entire sermons instead of watching sound bites and little clips out of, you know, out of the whole context of the message being delivered would understand that and anyone reading the Bible will understand that that this is how you unfortunately have to deal with it is that you 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 can't you know we need to push for the laws to be established like God's laws of course because these are right and these are true and if we had these laws in place you know our morality the, the whole country would be doing a lot better I believe now it's I mean it's laws can't change people's hearts and minds though 
they can do some they can do a little bit to 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 influence the um, the actions of people. Obviously, if you know they're going to be put to death for something, you'd be a lot less likely to do it. But ultimately, what we need in this country is people whose hearts and minds have been touched by the Word of God to, to get right with Him. I mean, the ultimate goal is that the law is unnecessary because everybody's just wants to obey and follow God's law um, and just do what's right, regardless of the consequences, just to be able to do what's right. But I don't want to get too far off on a tangent. Let's go back to Leviticus 20. We're going to see. I'm going to blow through these because I know I've already spent quite a bit of time preaching already. Um, and I've got a lot to cover. The other things covered, and I, you know what? I'm just going to list them off here. We read the whole chapter before service started. So we left off with, with a man lying with his father's wife. Well, it's the same thing with a man lying with his, his daughter-in-law. So if you have a son that gets married, you know, that's wickedness. That deserves the death penalty if you're lying with your daughter-in-law. Homosexuality. Leviticus 20, 13. If a man takes a wife and her mother, the Bible says they should be burnt with fire. So if, I, if, I, if I have, I'm married and then, and then have this, this relationship with, with my wife and her mother, that's just, that's just wicked. It's bizarre. It's, it's confusion. Um, bestiality, laying down with a beast, a man or a woman. And you know, with that, he's saying, look, you need to kill the person and kill the animal too. Like, get rid of that. Like, just, just wipe that out. That needs to be stamped out and, and, and destroyed because that is just confusion and wickedness. And the Bible also puts on witchcraft as well. The, 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 the death penalty in Leviticus 20, 27 says, A man also or a woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. God doesn't want us messing around with magic and with Ouija boards and with mediums and with tarot cards and with all this occultic stuff and messing around with the spirit world. He says, no, anyone who's doing that and getting into that should be put to death. I don't want you messing with that. And do I think that that's real? Yes, I do. There is a spiritual world. There are angels. There are devils. These th there are things that are unseen. The Bible talks about them. And God says you ought not to be messing with those things because you don't know anything about it. And what you're going to end up doing is you're going to be communicating with devils. Which is what's happened so many times. And people get possessed with devils. Stay away from the witchcraft. Um, the Bible puts the death penalty upon it. And in verse 22 of Leviticus 20, he says, You shall therefore keep all my statutes. This is a verse I was looking for earlier. And all my judgments and do them, that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out, and you shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. They did all of these things that we read in Leviticus 20. And there's more. We didn't even, you know, um, I didn't mention them because I'm just talking about the death penalty. But there's other sins that are listed there too that are not necessarily worthy of a death penalty. But he said the nations before, they did all those things. He said because they did all of those things, I hated them. Do you think if there's a country or a nation that does all of these things today, that now all of a sudden God's going to love that nation? That God's not going to hate them. Yeah, I hated them back then. But now, if you do all of these things, I'm going to love you. Though that's, that was Old Testament, man. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yeah, no big deal. Hey, you want to you wanna burn your babies in the fire to Molech? Fine. Hey, I love you. You want to have relations with an animal? Yeah, no big deal. That was Old Testament. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It's normal. We'll accept it and we'll love it. You don't understand God at all if you think that that's the way things are. But it, and also if you think that you can just pick out, no, I'm going to cross this one off. I'm going to cross off verse 13 because our culture today says that this is okay. The rest of those things, well, yeah, I mean, it, you shouldn't be doing those things. But this one, no. No, you can't just start picking and choosing which ones you like and which ones you don't like. They're all there. And as any country or any nation starts to get involved in these things and do all of these things, God's going to hate them. And you know what God does to the nations and the countries that he hates? He wipes them out. 
He says the land is going to spew you out. We need these laws for our own good so that we don't just get destroyed. Yeah, you want to embrace all the wickedness and sin? Guess what? It's going to be very short-lived. Because everybody's going to suffer. Instead of dealing with the rot, with the cancer of wickedness at the root and just getting rid of those wicked people, you're going to let it fester to the point to where it's incurable. And God's going to have to wipe out the whole nation. You know, he did that once with the whole world. With the flood. When men's wickedness upon the earth just grew and grew. And that was prior to the death penalty. God did not ordain the death penalty until after the flood. It says in um, Genesis 9, verse 6, this is after Noah gets off of the ark. He, you know, he, he destroys the whole world because it, you know, the wickedness of man is so great, he just needs to start over because people had gotten so bad. So in Genesis 9, 6, it says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Right off of that, right, the, starting brand new with Noah and his family, he institutes and says, okay, now we're going to start ha having some capital punishment because we don't want things to get out of hand like they did the first time. And when you eliminate the death penalty, when you eliminate these, these laws from being enforced, then you are going to have more and more wickedness abounding as was in the days pre-flood. And guess what's going to happen? God's going to get to the, let it get to the point to where he says, okay, well now you weren't able to handle it. You weren't able to listen to me. I already told you how to deal with all this stuff and you chose not, not to. Now it's to the point to where we're just going to have to wipe you out. You're going to start all over again. And, um, and that day's going to come unless we can get right with God. And that day's probably still going to come even if we can, like in the days of Josiah. But um, let's see some more laws. Leviticus 24 we see here blaspheming and cursing God. So remember we saw the one about children who, who curse their parents need to be put to death. Well, God also has a law about blaspheming or cursing the name of the Lord. In Leviticus 24.10, to give us this story, it says, And the son of an Israelitish woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the children of Israel. And this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed and they brought him unto Moses, and his mother's name was Shalometh, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in ward, that the mind of the Lord might be showed them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well the stranger as he that is born in the land. When he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. Again, this is a commandment of God. Anyone who blasphemes God and would curse God, he says they need to be put to death. Because what happens is when, when these types of sins aren't dealt with, People can look at that and start thinking that that's okay. And these extreme wicked behaviors need to be dealt with appropriately. And that's why there's different levels of laws. You know, I mean, if someone steals something, well, they need to return you know, five-fold or seven-fold you know, according to as the law dictates. And that's, that's pretty extreme. I mean, hey, seven times. Like, I just stole one thing. I got to pay you back seven times. That's a lot. You know why? Because you, don't, you ought not to be doing that. And it's, it's a deterrent to do something like that again. You need to shell out a lot to compensate for what you've done. And in instances like this, these people just need to be put to death is what the Bible's teaching. And we would have a much better, a much more respectful society if we had these laws in place. Um, also compelling people to serve other gods. To go out and say, you, know, you have someone saying, hey, let's go serve these, the gods of the heathen. That was also the death penalty. That was in Deuteronomy 13. I'm not going to turn there just for sake of time. I've got, I've got lots of pages of notes because I have all the scripture of, of every time where the death penalty is kind of brought up and mentioned and the laws associated with that. But I don't have the time to read all of the scripture. I wanted to, but I, I kind of knew this was going to happen, so I, 
I have titles of, of what everything is talking about. But if you want to look it up for yourself, um, I'm not, I'm not going to hide from any of God's words. I believe that they're all pure and they're all true and that this should be the law of the land. That's what I believe. Deuteronomy 13, if you want to read that later, um, talks about, you know, if, if someone's trying to entice you to go serve another God that's not God, that they should be killed. And it even says, um, Thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death. So the person, like if someone comes directly to you, you need to report that, and then you're going to be the one that's, that's going to be the first one to, to start throwing the stones at him because you are directly involved and that directly impacts you. And, you know, that the Bible tells us that we need to be hate, hating these sins and hating this wickedness. And when we carry out this type of a judgment, you need to hate the wickedness in order to carry out a judgment like that. You need to understand, it needs to get through to your head that this is a serious sin. And not to have so much compassion on people as to say that like, well, you're really sorry and I can see how much it's going to hurt you and all this other stuff and to just, to just not do it. and Because I can't stomach this. I don't want to see this person. But I don't want to be involved in putting this person to death. The only reason would be because you don't hate sin enough and how destructive and, and terrible sin is in and of itself, and especially these sins. That's what God's pointing out here, saying this is something that you really need to hate. You need to hate it so much that you are going to be able to, to carry out this sentence against somebody because it's something that is that bad and that you need to be prepared to do. And that this is the way that, that the judgment was carried out was carried out by the people. It wasn't just one executioner. It was the people. And especially the people who are affected personally by it were oftentimes the ones to, to be the first started on the, on the judgment being carried out. And um, it also explains in Deuteronomy 13, you know, in verse 14, it says, Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently, and behold, if it be truth and the thing certain, that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly, and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. And this is talking about an entire city going after a false god um, in the context. But what I want to point out is that he's saying you need to inquire, you need to make search. This isn't just a lynch mob. Okay, The Bible isn't, isn't ordaining a lynch mob mentality of like what they did with the woman caught in adultery. of the Hey, we fought, you know, and they're dragging her out. You got all these people saying, we need to put this woman to death. We need to put this woman to death. That's not the way the law was supposed to be handled either. Okay? There was supposed to be inquiry made, search made, diligent finding out of the facts, not just a lynch mob before you would convict somebody. You'd have witnesses, and their witnesses would have to agree together about somebody. And, and when the search is made, if it's, and it says that the thing is certain, if you know what happened, if, you know, everything is conducted and you find a person to be guilty, then that person should be executed. Then that's when judgment is carried out. And we can see that very clearly from the Bible. Um, and then it says to take the spoil of the city, burn the whole city with fire, burn everything up, and that it's not built again. Because they, you know, for people going after a false god, that's wickedness. You're going to be le think about if you allowed this, you know, this this wickedness of an entire city to go after another god. They had the Lord as their god, and then someone comes in and starts just just spreading these devils, this, the doctrines of devils, and, and this false god worship. How many souls are going to end up going to hell as a result of an entire city being turned unto a false god, and and bringing up these movements of serving false gods. And um, that's why he says um, that the whole city should be burned. And he said that's like a memorial, basically. So it's not going to be built again. And um, it's not tolerated. And this is what the, and you know what? A lot of people look at this and they'll say, oh, well, you're like the Taliban. No, because they're serving a false god. And the laws of the Lord are not the same as their laws. But they like to just associate everything together and say that that's, it's all the same thing and it's just religion is a problem and all this other stuff. But there is a God, and he's real, and we have his words. 
and this is, the, this is what he has ordained. Um, another death penalty situation, the Bible talks about working on the Sabbath day. In Numbers 15, it says, And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation, and they put him in ward, because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. That was the judgment for um, working on the Sabbath day. God had ordained the Sabbath day, and he said, Look, the Sabbath day is the day of rest. No man is supposed to be out working. You need to be resting because I've commanded it. Now, that is one of the commands that's been lifted in the New Testament. We are not um, bound to observe the Sabbath day. And again, I'm not going to prove that in this sermon. We have an entire sermon on the Sabbath. But that is one of those things. I was listed. But it was a, a crime that was worthy of the death penalty. Now, look, people will mock this. Again, the atheists will come out and the ignorant Christians will say, oh, I, you know, the guy was picking up sticks and you're going to put him to death. How is that just? God is holy. And you can hate God all you want for commanding this man to be put to death for gathering sticks on the Sabbath. But that doesn't change who he is. And that doesn't change what he said. You know, people can, you can mock and ridicule God or, or ridicule me and say, oh, you're ridiculous. Why should that man be put to death for gathering sticks? Because God said so. Because I believe God's word, and if God said that that's, what, that's the way it should be, then that's the way it should be. God's the one that instituted the Sabbath, and he said not to work, and he said that it's the death penalty for not doing it. And you know what? Go ahead and hate, hate me and hate God, but that's what his word says. And that's what I believe, and that's what I'm going to follow. Um, having a stubborn and rebellious son in Deut Deuteronomy chapter 21. Again, this is another thing that people, they go to these, these new versions too, have twisted what the Bible actually says. And they use different words. Like they use the word slave instead of servant. It'll use other words um, like just an unruly child as opposed to what this verse is talking about with a stubborn and rebellious son. Let's get this in context though because this one's important. De Deuteronomy 21. If you want to look there, open up your Bible to Deuteronomy 21. I want you to see this one. Because this is something that you'll get attacked for by the unbelievers. And I don't want you to be ignorant of the scripture and what the Bible actually talks about. Because what, what, the, what the enemy will say is that, well, you should be putting all kids to death then because all kids are disobedient. And no kids listen to their parents. That's not what this is saying. There's a difference. You have to, you have to read it in context and, and see what this is clearly stating. But you need to see it for yourself so you know what it says. Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. So we're going to start reading in verse 18. It says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto, him, unto them. So for, we see the first step here. Okay, you have a stubborn son, a rebellious son, rebelling against what they're saying, not wanting to do what they're telling him to do. And they've chastened him. They've disciplined him. So if you were to have a stubborn, rebellious son, and you discipline them, and then they, and then they obey, is there any problem here? No, because that's normal. That's what happens. You, you discipline your, your, your son, and, and, and you chasten him. And then, they, and then typically they should be listening to you. It says, but it, it continues. It says, they will not hearken unto them. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. But now look at what else they say. They say, he is a glutton and a drunkard. Now is this talking about a three-year-old or a four-year-old or a five-year-old? No. This is some, talking about someone a lot older and mature than that. This is not your, you know, like my ch little children back there that might disobey sometimes and get a spanking. And that it's not saying that, well, if they go and do the same thing again, that they need to be put to death. This is talking about a man that is the son of his parents, but he's a glutton and a drunkard and rebellious, and he's been chastened and he doesn't listen and, and, this is, this is who he is. You know, this, is, this is what he's done, that he's going to be put to death. This is not talking about some little child. Okay. Now, it may be a younger 
person, younger man, but obviously someone able to, to become a glutton and a drunkard and, and know about that. That's what this verse is talking about, um, about the, the, the rebellious son. Basically, someone who's just turning out to be worthless, a piece of trash person that, that doesn't want to do anything and has no character and, you know, um, whatever. He's uh, just a wicked person. And it says, And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones, that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. This is the attitude, this is the approach that needs to be taken with these types of sins. Um, Deuteronomy 22 talks about a woman who claims to be a virgin at marriage, and then it find, it's found out that she's not. The Bible says that that, that woman needs to be um, put to death. Adultery, again, in Deuteronomy 22 is mentioned. Um, and then it talks about rape and the rapist being put to death and obviously not the woman. So if a, if a woman's married and someone comes in and rapes her and she's, you know, she cries out, but no one's there to save her, no one's there to rescue her, no one's there to help her, you know, you're not going to put the woman to death. You're going to put the rapist to death. And that's covered in Deuteronomy 22. And a turn, if you would, to Exodus 21. We'll see a few more examples here. Um, well, you know, I'm just going to read through them. Exodus 21, it gives a good definition between murder versus manslaughter. Um, that's the words that we would use today. Murder is like intentionally killing somebody versus manslaughter is someone who happens to die and it's, it's more of an accident. Like you're not intending, if, if I were to get in a car accident today and, you know, uh, maybe I run a red light, Okay. And I and I and I kill the person that I that I run into. But it's an accident. I wasn't gunning for him. I wasn't trying to hurt anybody. Didn't see the light. I caused it. You know, I'm at fault. But I caused the death of another person. Now, it's a serious thing to happen. But the death penalty is not ordained for that crime, even though a person has died. That's what the you know what we would call manslaughter. It was not something I was intending to do. And in the Bible, they had cities where that person would go to, they'd flee to. So I'd have to be like, I'd have to leave. They'd say, okay, you need to get out of town. You're going to go live over here in this city of refuge, and you have to stay there until the death of the priest. And I'd, I'd have to be there, like, however long that is, and I have to be away. And I think part of that is because, you know, it's uh, you have the family of the of the of the person who died there, and you know they're going to see you, and it's going to be, you know, it could be very um, emotional, and they could you know hate you and whatever else. It's just this is the way they designed it. Said okay, well you're going to have to go over there and stay there, and if you left, as what the Bible says, if you if you you know if you go to that city of refuge and then you get out of the city and you leave, and the revenger of blood, which would be like the next of kin to that person or whoever, they saw you and they wanted to kill you and they killed you, like your blood's going to be upon your own head for that because you were supposed to stay in that city and stay protected there. And um, if someone wanted to carry out vengeance against you and you were out of that city, then that's your own fault is basically what he's saying. But, um, and that's what says, I'll read it real quick. Exodus 21, 12 says, He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, so he's not like, like trying to get him, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whether he shall flee. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. Um, the Bible talks in Exodus 21, 15 about children who smite their parents, who actually hit them, who actually would, would turn their hand and, and strike their parents, um, that they should be put to death. It says, and he that smiteth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. Kidnapping, another death penalty crime. He that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Um, again, another reference to cursing parents in Exodus 21, 17. And then look at this one, Exodus 21, 22. Exodus 21, 22. Here's another one that would look, be looked at as crazy today because it's sanctioned by the government as being okay with, with no crime being done. Exodus 21, 22 says, If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her. This is talking about two men are fighting. And somehow a woman gets involved 
and gets hit or gets hurt and the baby dies in her womb. This is, this is the event that happens. It says, Yet no mischief follow. He shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judges determine. So it's saying, if it was an accident, that's what it means by no mischief follow. If it wasn't intentional, if things got out of hand and these guys are fighting and, and you know, again, it was an accidental death that was caused as a result, um, then he's going to have to pay for it. Okay, whatever the judges determine, he's going to have to pay, you know, to help them out or whatever as, as, a, as a judgment for that. But it says in verse 23, and if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Bible talks about a baby in the womb being life. The baby is alive. It's a baby. It's a human being. This is not just some fetus. This is not just some blastocyst. This is life. And if that baby dies in that womb and it was intentional, that's murder. He says, you need to give life for life. And you got these doctors that are going in and cutting up these little babies and pulling them out of the womb. There needs to be life for life for those innocent, defenseless children that are being killed in their mother's womb. If we had a just society, that would be the death penalty judgment against these people. Uh, the Bible also talks about if you're an animal owner and um, you have an animal, like an ox, that gores somebody through. Well, if it was an accident, again, you're not going to be put to death for that person's death. But if you have an animal, let's say you have a dog, and this dog has been known to be aggressive, and it's already bit people and attacked people, and that dog gets out and kills somebody, then you will be put to death because you were not responsible for your own animal that you knew was already prone to doing something like that. You had foreknowledge that something like this could happen and you didn't prevent it from happening. Now you are responsible and you will be put to death for that. That's what the Bible says. Um, Exodus 22 goes into a lot about... Um, uh, turn, turn there if you would because I want to make another point here. It talks about witchcraft and bestiality and serving other gods. But turn to Exodus 22 because I want to I want to point this out. The Bible also talks about using a weapon to kill someone and being a murderer, and it also talks about an instance with um, you know the Levites were responsible for taking up and set, setting up and taking down the tabernacle, the tabernacle of God. That was their job, and if a stranger were to come onto the tabernacle, that they would be put to death. That's how God said, you know, it was, they were supposed to be holy and set apart to do this work for God. And the tabernacle was holy and that they were the only ones allowed to do this. So if um, someone else came, if a stranger came to do that, they said that they would be put to death. That's another um, capital crime in Numbers chapter 1. And i um, trying to see if there's any other. Okay. That just about covers everything. I'm going to read from Exodus 22 here. Verse 18 is we're going to start reading. The Bible says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Whosoever lieth with a beast shall surely be put to death. He that sacrificeth unto any god, save unto the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. Now, people like to mock the Bible, especially the Old Testament where we find these laws. But then they like other parts and they want to keep them. And this is where the hypocrisy comes in. So the hypocrisy, for one, I already pointed out, is where there's certain laws that people be like, well, yeah, they should be punished. That should be the law. But then there's other ones who say, well, no, that shouldn't be the law. It's because they're coming up out of the imagination of their own heart what they decide is just and what is unjust. But look at Exodus. You know, we just read a few um, verses on, on people being put to death like a witch or someone who lies with a beast or sacrificing another god. But look at verse 21. It says, Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. If you lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as an usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. These are things that a lot of people would, would embrace and say, well, yeah, these are really good things, and we should be following these things today. 
because they sound more pleasant because you're not putting someone to death because they're saying, oh yeah, we need to watch out for the poor. We need to watch out for the widows. We need to protect them and help them and do good unto them. And that's what this is, this is saying here. But you have the hypocrites that will say, well, no. Putting someone to death should be done away, but we're going to keep this part. We're going to mix and match what we like out of the Bible, and it's pure hypocrisy. And people complain about the Old Testament law and that, well, we should just live by Jesus' words. We should only do what Jesus said, and like, like, like loving our neighbor as ourselves. And, it's, and they're all for it. Yeah, we should love our neighbor as ourselves. Here's what's interesting about that. One of the quotes from loving our neighbor as ourselves, Mark 12, I'll read it for you in verse 30 says, Jesus Christ was speaking. He says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So people say, oh, see, look, there's no greater commandment than these. You know, you need to love your neighbor. It's about loving your neighbor. It's about doing this. Guess where that quote comes from? That quote is found a few times in the New Testament about loving your neighbor as yourself. It's found one time in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus, in the very book that these hypocrites want to mock and ridicule and say, oh, that's the Old Testament. Oh, that's the old law. We need to get rid of this. But love your neighbor as yourself is in Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus 19.18 says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Jesus Christ, when he said to love your neighbor as yourself, was quoting Leviticus. He was establishing the law. He didn't say, oh yeah, pff, that Old Testament stuff. Yeah, Leviticus 19, we don't need that anymore because now I'm here to abolish the law. Nope. Sorry, my friends. You can't pick and choose the parts of the Bible that you want to live by because you don't like other things, because you don't like what they say. We need to embrace the law of the Lord as being perfect. He knows what's best for us. He knows the way our society should be run. He has already laid the groundwork and given us the laws and the rules that we need to follow and we ought to be following them today. And don't get backed up or backed down on these people that want to attack you for believing in God's word because it is God's word. And they're the ones that are ridiculous and their arguments don't stand up to the truth of the Bible. One other punishment I forgot actually that the, law to, that the Bible talks about is when there's a matter that rises up that needs to go before judges, or before the priest, and... Um, if a judgment is made, but then a person doesn't, doesn't listen to that judgment, doesn't obey the, the judgment that was passed down of saying, well, this is what needs to happen, then that person is put to death. That was another cause for the death penalty. But um, real quickly here, I'm almost done. I'm, I'm on my last pages. Uh, I'm not going to go into, as I thought I would, uh, um, go into the, the changes from the Old Testament and the New Testament and a few of the laws that actually were changed, like the Sabbath, as I mentioned before, um, or the laws regarding the Levitical priesthood. I've preached two sermons on understanding the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's a part one and a part two. And if you want to understand what the changes were, listen to those sermons, because I went into great detail about what was changed and what wasn't from the Bible, from what the Bible actually says about that. Um, so are there a few instances where God's law contains the, those aspects of, of the Levitical priesthood law that was changed? Yes. But the vast majority of these laws that we're looking at today, whether it be lying down with a beast, whether it be lying with your you know, father's wife, whether it be you know, any, whatever, any of these things that we, we're seeing here, that have not been done away with in the New Testament, they should still be applied today. They're still applicable for us to have as a law today, and that's what we should be living by um, if we were living in a righteous country. And the Bible says that um, the criteria for condemning someone, it says, and it be, um, 
I'll start reading. Deuteronomy 17, verse 2 says, If there be found among you within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God in transgressing his covenant, and hath gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or moon or any of the hosts of heaven, which I have not commanded, and it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel, then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shalt stone them with stones till they die. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. This is God's way of putting evil away from among us. It's a death penalty in, in these instances and in, with these laws. He says we need to just get that out of our society, out of our culture. It, is just, it needs to be eliminated. It needs to be removed like a cancer. It needs to just be quick, take care of it. It needs to be expedient. It needs to be, the judgment needs to come quickly and done. Not some big, long ordeal. As, as soon as the, the search is made, if there's, if there's ample evidence to, to convict somebody of one of these capital crimes, they just need to be put to death. And that's the way that our country ought to be run today. That's the way that I push for um, is, is a way uh, where we can actually put God in charge of running our country. Not some president, not some king, not anyone else, but the Lord, the God, Jehovah of the Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I truly do love your law. I pray that you would please just help us to stand firm on your words, not be backed down by people who hate you and hate your law, dear Lord, that we wouldn't be ignorant of these things, but that we would embrace them um, as we know that the law is, is truth and that your word is truth, dear Lord, and we can learn from them. I, God, I pray that you would please just help us to be able to inform other Christians about this, that they wouldn't be ignorant and um, start attacking or fighting other Christians who are actually doing good work and standing up and fighting for you, dear Lord, um, that they wouldn't be fighting within ourselves, but that they would get right and that they would recognize your word as supreme and should be the supreme authority in all of our lives, dear Lord. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.